Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn some game theory. Today we're going to go over backward induction. And to do that, we're going to use this game that I created precisely for this purpose. I'm calling it the backward induction game. And it doesn't really have any intuition or story behind it. I just want to use it to go over the intuition behind backward induction and how to solve games more complicated than Selton's game uh, using backward induction. Selton's game, of course, being what we were looking at in the last two videos. So in this game, player one stays or goes. If he goes, player two leaves or joins. And if player two joins, then player one agrees or disagrees. And those are the payoffs uh, associated with each of those outcomes. And so with backward induction, what we're going to be doing is looking forward to the end of the game and working our way backward. What do I mean by that? Well, rather than trying to explain it, I think it would be best if we went over an example here and you can see for yourself how it works in practice. So what we want to do is we want to start at the last subgame of the game. And the last subgame of this is just going to be, well, right here, when player one either agrees or disagrees. When player one makes this move here, he knows exactly where he is and how he got there. It means that player one originally had to go and then player two joined. That's how player one gets in this situation. And so now that player one knows exactly where he is and what happens when he makes each of these moves, agrees or disagrees, then player one can rightfully choose, well, which strategy plays the best. And that's going to be disagree here for 15 uh, being better than 10. So player one would want to disagree because 15 is better than 10. And the idea of using backward induction to find subgame perfect equilibria is that your subgame perfect equilibrium will have a Nash equilibrium in every subgame of the overall game. So right here, the Nash equilibrium is going to be for player one to disagree for the logic that we just explained. So when we go back to this original game, instead of looking at this subgame now, where it was originally agree or disagree, we know what player one is going to do. He's going to disagree. So rather than having some sort of uncertainty between this payoff here, this 15-5, and this 10-10, negative the Nash equilibrium of this subgame is going to be 15-5. So we can just replace these two payoffs with just this one, and now we can condition player two's behavior based off of that. So what do I mean by that? Well, if we chop off this other part of the game and we go to this subgame where now there's two things going on here, well, we know that if player two were to join, then player one would disagree. It's in player one's best interest to do so. So if player two joins, she is not going to get negative 10. She knows that. She's going to get 5. So player 2 would not want to leave here because negative 5 is worse than 5. If player 2 joins, then player 1 disagrees and she ends up with 5. Now, player 2 might want to leave if she thinks that player 1 would agree here because that would leave player 1, excuse me, that would leave player 2 with negative 10, which is much worse than negative 5. But there's just no reason why player one would do that. So we've replaced this payoff with this Nash equilibrium payoff. And knowing that, we can now see that player one would not want to leave. She would want to join, and then that would cause player one to disagree. So now we can work back one last step, and we get to the original game as a whole, where now we've just replaced these agrees and uh, leaves with a join disagree. So we know that if player two goes, that player two, it's automatic that she's going to join and that player one is going to disagree and will end up in this outcome. And given that, player one's choice between staying and getting zero and going, having player two join, and then player one after that disagreeing, well, 15 is better than zero. That's what player one would want to do. Player one might not want to go if he thought that player two would leave because that would leave player one with negative five, which is worse than zero, but that's just not going to happen. Player two would want to join because she knows that player one would disagree. So that is the outcome of this game. Player one goes, player two joins, and player one disagrees. And we can write the equilibrium just like this. Player one goes and disagrees, and player two joins. And that's just about it with backward induction. I think backward induction uh, at least the introductory straightforward parts of it. Um, it is one of the easiest concepts for players or for game theorists or people learning game theory. It's one of the easiest things for them to pick up on. It's very intuitive, very natural. It seems just like a very logical way of solving games. And indeed, as we saw here, I think it pretty, pretty much is uh, exactly that. It is very straightforward and intuitive. But it can get a little bit dicey when you start adding extra information sets, uh, simultaneous move games, like a, a stag hunt at the end of one of these information nodes, something like that. 
and we'll actually be going into those particular cases in future videos and we'll ultimately see that despite backward inductions somewhat straightforward uh, concept and intuition that there can actually be problems with it but that's for future videos and i hope you join me then i'll see you there